story. Um, we are coming to you live right now from MIT's Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Uh, I'm Amy Robinson with Sebastian Sons Neuroscience Lab, um, primarily with iWire. It's a game to map the brain. You probably know what it is since we're all assuming this hangout. Uh, and I'm joined right here by Steve Ramirez. What's up? Yeah, who just published a really cool paper on implanting false memories in the brain. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of. <laughs> it's really, really cool, and that's what we're going to be talking about. He'll be answering your questions, just talking about um, the neuroscience of memory in general. So I also want to introduce, we've got Will Silversmith here. Hello. Hi, I'm Will Silversmith. I'm a developer for iWire's website. Yeah, the, he's the developer. Will Will builds the front end of iWire. They actually play. He's responsible for profiles and all kinds of features. So... So yeah, I guess without further ado, oh, um, leave your leave your questions on the event page, um, which I think you can also get to by the YouTube video, um, and Steve will answer them. But first, we're gonna kind of go over his research. Yeah. So, uh, so like Amy said, I'm Steve. I'm a graduate student in MIT's Brain and Cognitive Science Department. Uh, and my work focuses on manipulating memories. Um, so the work that we put out this year kind of builds on our work that we started last year. Uh, the idea is that it's possible to go into the brain and find the brain cells that represent, say, one specific memory. And then you find those brain cells and you can trick only those brain cells to respond to just pulses of light. So now you can literally go into the brain and shoot light and, say, reactivate a memory. And that's the work that we put out last year. And then this year we built on that by asking, okay, now that we can shoot light into the brain and reactivate a memory, can we begin to tinker with that memory? Can we, in essence, change the contents of that memory to make it a new but false memory? So let me back up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, does it, what does it mean to shoot light into the brain? What do you mean when you say that? Yeah, so we actually have to take these tiny, tiny optic fibers and surgically lower them into the brain, and then we can uh, target them to whatever brain area we want and shoot light into the brain. Like, we literally just turn it on. It's like a light switch that we can click on in the brain. That's crazy. And that, and that causes neurons to fire. Yeah, so actually neurons normally don't respond to pulses of light on their own, so we can sort of genetically trick them uh, to artificially install this sort of light-sensitive switch so that now the neurons that express this light-sensitive switch, we can use light to click those on. That's really amazing. <laughs> <laughs> How um, deep inside the brain do they go? Sorry? How deep do they go? Uh, they can go as, as deep as we want. It's um, You just have to sort of like predefine how far you want them to go. Uh, and they can go anywhere in the brain, high and low, left and right. Oh, sweet. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking for, I'm sorry, I'm prowling the event pages for uh, for questions right now. I wonder, this little eyewire logo that's popped up. Weird. It's like shameless self yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, I wonder if the live viewers are seeing um, an eyewire logo or our faces. <laughs> oh, back to our faces. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so you guys, can you go into a little bit Deeper, deeper explanation of, of what what you actually did. Yeah. Like, so, how, so, yeah. Okay, so let's say, um, so we know that we can find part of the memory in the brain. So let's say we take our animals and we put them in two completely different boxes, right? We'll call them box A and box B. So Here, we, I'll make props for you. Okay, box. Bo box A and box B. So we take our animals and we put them in box A and we find the memory for box A. So we you find, find the memory. Yeah, like we go into the brain, we see which brain cells light up when the animal is in, in, in box A. And How those do you see are, that? So every time a brain cell is active, they leave behind a sort of genetic footprint. Mm. So we can go into the brain and look for those footprints, and that lets us know that a memory was just being processed in that area. Cool. So, so let's say we find the memory for box A. So now <laughs> the next day, all right, and we make the brain cells that represent that memory, only the brain cells that represent box A, we make those cells now sensitive to pulses of light. So now, the next day, let's say we put the animals in a completely, completely different box, not box A or B, just a completely different box that they've never been in before. T-Rex box. And T-Rex box. And <laughs> we put the animals in the T-Rex box, and now we can shoot light into the brain to reactivate the memory of box A. So in these experiments, we asked, what would happen if while the animals were in box A, or sorry, while they were recalling the memory of box A, but while they were in the dinosaur box, and then we give them just a couple of mild foot shocks. So we're using light to reactivate the memory of box A while they're getting a couple of mild foot shocks to try to artificially connect the two. So we're just trying to connect the dots between the two. So to test if we had actually done that, when we 
put the animals back either in box A or in box B, they should show fear behavior in box A, but not in box B. And that's exactly what we see. So it's arguing that we were able to artificially connect the memory of box A and some kind of aversive fearful information, such as a couple of mild foot shocks. So that's what we're calling a new but false memory, because we took a memory for a neutral environment and basically updated it with aversive information and turned it into a fear memory. That's really crazy. So an analogy might be, I was at a, say I'm at a scary movie. Mm -hmm. Say I'm at Pixar's Monsters University. Good movie. <laughs> it's, not really, it's not really scary, but there's a scary part in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and say, okay, so it's, it's scary when the monsters are trying to be scary. And then later you go to the beach, and if you were able to reactivate the part of my brain that was active when I was experiencing the scary part of a movie while I was at a beach, which is really nice and calm, I would be scared. At so the you should, yeah. At that moment, you, at theoretically, you should begin to display this kind of fearful behavior of being at the beach because you've artificially made that kind of connection. That's really cool. Yeah, and actually, just to completely put this out there, one of the most common questions we get is why fear? Like that—that that sounds kind of evil. Like we're these evil scientists in white coats, right? And um, the reality of it is that fear behavior is really easy to measure. The animal is either. Uh, moving around, exploring a safe environment, minding its own business, or when it's displaying fear behavior, it's kind of crouched, huddled in a corner. It's what we call freezing behavior. So freezing behavior is sort of a binary output. The animal is either completely staying still with his deer and headlights look, or they're moving around, like I said, minding their own business in a box. Now that said, there are a group of talented grad students and postdocs in the lab who are now trying to do these exact experiments with pleasurable memories. So it, it does, it can have a slightly happier ending, and uh, that is something that's being worked on right now, so that it's not all just fear that we're working on. Nice. So you can, so you're going to figure out if maybe I can condition my brain to associate beach vacations with learning something very hard, so that so, I love it. <laughs> it's a little bit of a ways out there, but we're starting with just memories of female mice and male mice, so that's the <laughs> But as simple as a pleasurable <laughs> number you get. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let me see. Will, do you have any questions for Steve? I'm going to check the um, the event pages and see if anyone has any questions on um, just neuroscience of memory in general. Sure. So when you were talking about uh, how, so when you were talking about how you identify the fearful memory, and you said it had some sort of a genetic signature. Uh, what does that look like? Is that like using an fMRI technique, or is that using uh, another kind of like optogenetic technique? Right. So that <laughs> is a fantastic question. So you can think of it as a sort of molecular fMRI, something that doesn't exist in humans yet. So oh, um, what cool. We can, what we uh oh, I, I've lost your sound. <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> so every time a brain cell is active there's a whole host of events that happen inside of the cell. There's a whole bunch of molecular baton handoffs, so on and so forth. Now, one of the things that happens is the activation of a really specific set of genes. And those genes are called activity-dependent genes because their expression depends on the activity of the cell. So those genes are only active whenever a brain cell is active. So that means that in a very real sense, those genes have biological sensors that know when a brain cell is turned on. So that means that uh, whenever a brain cell is on, we can go and look for those biological sensors and see, are they turned on? Is this gene expressing? Because if it is, we know that that brain cell was recently active. I see. So you can see this. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, when it's when neurons, they look a little different. Yeah, just a tiny <laughs> <point>. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Making analogies here. <laughs> Yeah, you can actually go in and see what was recently turned on, what was recently turned off, and it's basically by trying to identify these genes that are only turned on when brain cells are active. So let's say, for example, you're making a memory, right? When you're making uh -huh. a memory, there's a really specific subset of your brain cells that are active when you're making that memory. So only those brain cells now will contain this, uh, will contain these genes that are turned on. So you can just go in and sort of do a little scavenger hunt looking for those genes, and that'll indirectly tell you that those cells were just turned on. So that's how you can tell sort of where a memory has been processed throughout the brain. So that's really incredible then that we already know that there are like certain genes that are that are sig that are um, we already know that there are certain genes that are strongly associated with forming memories and things like that. Then. Oh yeah, absolutely. There's been sort of a uh, 30 or 40 years of trying to identify the really crucial players of 
you know, which genes are important for memory. Um, there are some genes that if you knock them out, you get a crazy amount of memory impairments. There are some genes that if you overexpress them, you might even improve learning or improve memory. So it can go in both directions, which is kind of cool. That's fabulous. Yeah. And just as a disclaimer, this is all completely in rodents, so we're not going to be overexpressing <laughs> these genes in humans anytime soon. But. Sure, sure. <laughs> Um, so we have actually a question awesome. from Rebecca Rebecca Balter from the Google Plus event page. And she asks, um, which brain regions were the neurons in mm -hmm. uh, for the mouse and box experiment? How many neurons did you activate to create, um, to create, I guess, the memory of the box experience? Thousands, hundreds? OK, so the brain region we're working in is called the hippocampus. So we started with the hippocampus because there's basically been decades and decades worth of research that suggests that the hippocampus uh, is really involved in processing the kinds of memories that we hold near and dear, like the time you got into college, memory of a first kiss, what you had for breakfast this morning. Uh, Red when, Bull. Red Bull, yeah. <laughs> Lots of coffee. <laughs> two or three cups of coffee for me. Uh, so you need your hippocampus to really make those kinds of memories that are literally your personal autobiography over time. Uh, so it made it a logical place for us to start and go in and maybe try to find certain parts of a memory. And now, the question as to whether it's hundreds or thousands, this is what really surprised us is, um, if it's one thing that I hope, or one of a couple of things that I hope everybody takes away from this, is that uh, the movie Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind got one really important thing wrong, and that's that memories aren't located in tiny little patches of the brain. It's not like you can go into the brain and say, oh, here is a memory, or here is a memory. They're distributed throughout the brain. So memories are processed throughout the brain, high and low, ancient and modern parts of the brain, and they're really distributed throughout the brain. So the part of the hippocampus that we were working on, I would say, had in the order of thousands to maybe tens of thousands of neurons that we could activate, and this basically jump-started uh, the recollection of a memory. So the answer is definitely in the thousands, uh, more so than in the hundreds, but not in the millions either. So it's somewhere there in the middle. And that's, and that's in a mouse. Do you have any neurons that are in a mouse brain? Yeah, OK, so in humans, it's about 100 billion. Uh, in mice, it's a lot less than that. <laughs> <laughs> because a mouse brain is, what, this big-ish? Yeah, a mouse brain is about this big. Human brains this big. <laughs> is about this big. Yeah, yeah. about this uh, big. <laughs> 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 um, and actually, we had another question from Ash Moore in chat, from Ashley Morin. So we're, we're also taking questions in, in iWire chat, which is awesome. Um, does the effect, the false memory effect, fade over? over time? Yeah, that we haven't tested yet, so that is a fantastic question. Um, it basically is going to consume my life for the next couple of months trying to figure it out, but we know that we can, uh, a day later, for example, we can get this putative false memory effect. Uh, we haven't tested it, say, 14 days later, 28 days later, for this sort of uh, remote memory, memories that are really remote in time. Uh, we haven't tested yet that. I would hope so. I think that would be really cool, because then that argues that qualitatively, the kind of false memory that we're inducing is actually qualitatively similar to a real memory, in that real memories also last for, say, 28 days. Um, it's a pretty simple experiment to do, one that I haven't done yet. So theoretically, the longer you train the mouse in that scenario, the, the longer the memory would last? Right, the stronger the memory. The stronger. Yeah, yeah, the more persistent it would be over time. Cool. Yeah. So, is it, so using the technique that you have right now, would it be possible to see whether your local changes to that area would be the same, or whether, like, so, so say the mouse had, a, had like, long-term potentiation in the memory. Would okay. you be able to see whether that was due to uh, the local change that you made or due to a more distributed change? So we could, yeah, yeah. So for that, we would actually have to go and intervene both in the hippocampus and in other areas that we think are important for processing this memory. And we'd have to intervene and, for example, block certain things like long-term potentiation and see if this also has memory deficits. Uh, that is a study that requires certain levels of pharmacology that we haven't touched on yet. So as of now, we can only speculate. Cool. Yeah. didn't really ask me about you, so how did you get into researching this? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so there was, um, I got into, like, interested in neuroscience. Uh, yeah, in neuroscience, and how did that evolve into false memories, real memories? Yeah, so... Um, I guess false memories are real memories. So are they? For, they for are. the people who have the false memories, they feel like real memories. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in neuroscience in general, uh, I started off college literally having no idea what in the world I wanted to do. I kind of liked a little bit of everything. 
Uh, and then just chatting with some advisors and taking a couple of neuro classes, I got into it. I realized that there's something kind of romantic about being able to study like a ball of meatloaf in your head to try to figure out what makes you tick. That's kind of cool. I think it's a fun job to be able to say that your routine is to go into the lab and fillet the mind to try to figure out how the brain works. I think that's really cool. <laughs> um, so that's how I got into neuroscience. And then in memory or in false memories and memory reactivation, um, I don't know, I guess I can say this because I'm a grad student now, but every movie like Inception, Total Recall, Eternal Sunshine, they all just completely peak your creativity, right? Like I really do think that Hollywood is such an awesome repository for these kinds of questions that most people just kind of ignore and they say, oh, that could never happen. Uh, but the answer, the, the answer is like we, we don't know if they can happen or not. And it's kind of cool to go in and try to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was got a dinosaur still in. Um, <laughs> there we go. Yep. <laughs> so, thanks. <laughs> so, I got interested in these false memory questions because the way I look at it is that the more and more we figure out how the brain works, then the better equipped we are to predict what happens when brain pieces break down, to figure out, for example, how cognition is impaired and all that stuff. And false memories are one of those really sort of quirky cognitive hiccups, right, that nobody really knows how they're formed or why they're formed. We know that they happen all the time in humans. Um, so I work with an absolutely remarkable team in lab, and we all just sat in a conference room one day, and we're like, all right, so things like Inception were cool movies, the concepts were awesome. If we want to really bring that into the stuff of you know experimental reality, what kind of experiments do we have to do? That's awesome. Yeah, so really? That's how you get that's how you <laughs> <gonna> <laughs> that? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. We were just like, that's, that's, that's so much fun, fun dude. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, we were, it was about, um, probably about a dozen of us who were all just, like, super brain enthusiasts about this kind of stuff, and uh, we all we all went into the lab, and we sat down, and we were like, this was after our first project worked, after being able to reactivate a specific memory. So once that worked, we were like, okay, where do we go from here? Like, what's the next step with this kind of technology? Uh, and then we had some, we had a billion and one different ideas, but the false memory one was just, that one was cool, because that one would really demonstrate for the first time that you could go into the brain and artificially change the contents of a memory. You could change, for example, a neutral memory into something pleasurable or something aversive. So that tells us a lot about just how reconstructive and how malleable memories actually are. Um, the whole false memory angle to it is, is potentially really interesting, um, and it does generate a lot of predictions about how this kind of memory updating process might actually work. So that was enough to sell us on the project and. Uh, we came out of the conference room hours and hours later, uh, and then finally just said that you know we had to move at 120 miles per hour and try to make it work. That's that's an awesome <laughs> origin of scientific research studies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. So Chris Nolan, if you're hearing this, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See, Hollywood does have some benefits. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so how long until you teach a mouse kung fu? <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not authorized to speak. No, uh, I think the, the next step for sure is, is there's a couple. Like One is to, to try to get this to work, for example, with pleasurable memories. Uh, that also tells us just how flexible the hippocampus is in processing any kind of memory. It can be aversive, it can be pleasurable. Uh, that's one thing. And then the other thing, uh, and this is sort of a Hail Mary idea, is imagine being able to take this technology and apply it to certain kind of neuropsychiatric or neurodegenerative disorders. Like, imagine being able to go into the brain um, of a mouse, for example, a mouse model of PTSD and identify the traumatic emotional components of it and temporarily inhibit it, or maybe update it with slightly more neutral or positive undertones. Uh, that would be, I mean, that would be fantastic, because that would really speak to just how much this, these kinds of interventions could work, at the very least, in mice. That's a, that's a great application. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we actually have another question from iWire Chat. Right. From from Kikirikani. Kikirikani. If you're in Hawaii, that's how you would say it. So, <laughs> so, I've never been. Yeah. <laughs> Iceland and Honolulu. Oh, I'm jealous. Okay, so <laughs> I think we all need like MIT brain retreat. Hawaii. In Hawaii, yeah. yeah I think that, that needs to happen. That would be. <laughs> that sounds necessary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll do the positive. Reinforcing of all the, <laughs> the hard lab work to associate with the beaches there. Um, so, <laughs> so Tiki Nikani asks, um, when someone has dementia, what's going on with their memory that makes them mix up their memories and forget things? It's a good question. That is a fantastic question. And now, 
the quick answer is that there's no simple answer. Uh, there are a couple of speculations and a couple of hypotheses as to why that's happening. Um, example, right? So uh, in in people with Alzheimer's disease, you you, all, you get these kinds of um, like feedback from family members that you know my grandma or my grandfather no longer remembers who I am, and I'm actually their daughter or I'm their granddaughter or grandson. Uh, you get these kinds of you get these kind of feedback from families that are saying that their memories just don't seem to be there anymore. Now, the question that nobody really knows the answer to is, so we know that Alzheimer's really hits the hippocampus and it hits it hard. It really begins to break it down over time. So now, is that, that's doing one of two things. Like, that's either, one, erasing these memories so that the, uh, the person with Alzheimer's just no longer has these memories anymore because their hippocampus is just broken down. Uh, or two, they do have the memories, but you need the hippocampus to access those memories stored somewhere else in the brain. So no one knows the answer to that. Is it the memories that are erased, or because the hippocampus is broken, we just can't access those memories anymore? It's one of those two things, or maybe it's a little bit of both. Um, but yeah, I mean, we just know that with things like Alzheimer's, that when they hit the hippocampus, it gets rid of that ability to actually recall certain kinds of memories, especially ones, uh, more recent memories, right, that happened, for example, right before the onset of Alzheimer's. Uh, but it's a great question. I mean, it's something that's being studied by hundreds, if not thousands, of labs worldwide right now to try to get at that answer, and potentially to try to reverse it, too. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, that's a good question. Sorry, we were, re we were reading chat, um, and T.E. Kiri Kani is, um, is Finnish, not from Finland, we were not, not Hawaii. We were only up by a couple of miles. <laughs> they both have water near both of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they both have land. Yeah. <laughs> People, presumably. <laughs> okay, so we don't have any other live questions, and we've got about we got eight minutes left. All right. So, how about I take this laptop around? Can you show us your lab? Yeah, we yeah, go. absolutely. This is a huge lab. So, so you work with uh, Tomagawa, yeah, who's a yeah. Nobel Prize winner, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's pretty legit. These so are our next door neighbors. He he actually has a pretty awesome story because uh, he won the Nobel Prize in the late '80s for immunology, and basically just decided, you know what, I I'm no longer interested in immunology. Uh, brain science is the next frontier because we don't really know what's happening in between our ears. Things like consciousness and all these lofty topics, nobody really has a direct answer to them. So for him, he thought that that is the next frontier. So I want to go and completely just switched fields. And you know, now, a couple of decades later, here we are. That's awesome. Yeah. Not like Sebastian Zong. He was a theoretical physicist. He yeah. was like, I want to change the world of neuroscience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can give you a tour of the lab. There's um. There's going to be, I mean, every single lab bench is, I, I like to think that they're a reflection of the thought processes that are going on in the people who own those lab benches. So as you're going to see, they're all complete and utter messes. Uh, <laughs> and none of them are organized at all. This is probably one of the more organized ones behind us. Uh, and this is where all the wet lab stuff happens, pipetting, making random reagents, mixing chemical A with chemical B, hoping it doesn't explode. And we can make periodic videos in here. <laughs> yeah. You have any experiments we can do? Yeah, we can think of some. <laughs> Future hangouts, guys. <laughs> okay. Right. Um, okay. Let me do a quick one to quickly just to double check everything. Okay. Right okay. He's yeah. going to make sure that, that everything in the lab is actually able to be shown. Because um, I'm just kind of sprung this on Steam about five minutes before the hangout uh, in that. Oh yeah, we're gonna do a lab tour with you guys. This is a this is a really large lab. So um, we're we're doing. We're doing a hangout, uh, a virtual tour of Sung Lab on Thursday, and so you'll see the size difference. We're much, much smaller. Um, yeah? Yeah. Much, much. Right, let's do it. All right. So, so. one thing you're also going to notice is that every single one of these lab benches more or less looks the exact same. They all just kind of have a whole bunch of bottles of shenanigans. Yeah, look at all that. What is all this stuff? I don't know. We've no. got <laughs> to do chemistry videos in here, guys. <laughs> Seriously. Have you seen? There's a subreddit for chemical reaction gifts. What? Really? <laughs> it's amazing. I had no idea. Okay, so we're disrupting everyone in the lab, so I'll try to be quiet. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> so we have, so tell me, what is the stuff, what's going on in here? Uh, most of this is, actually some of it is kind of cool. So some of the bottles and chemicals that you see behind face. you. Oh, there's my face. <laughs> so some of the bottles and chemicals that you see Let's behind go. you. I'll go show you some of the chemicals over here. Yep. So, what is that, gold dust? We can, what is that stuff? I don't know, actually. I don't know what half of this stuff is. No, but... So some of the chemicals are, let's say you form a memory, and let's say you want to go into the brain and physically identify the brain cells that are holding on to that memory. Mm. There's a lot of these that we can mix and basically go in and stain the brain, and then what we can see is a memory light up. Um, 
That's about cool. half of this is dedicated to that. Wow. And then the other half is dedicated to like my new show and who knows what. Wow. Well, making it happen, man. Yeah. So this this lab keeps going. Wow, there's a lot. Yeah. Look, here's Jack Sparrow. Captain Jack? A daily influence. Yes. It's so nice to have a daily influence. Be with you. Wow, there's a lot of little tubes back there. Yeah, we get a great view here. Oh, yeah. Here. You want to see, let's look at the view out there, lab. This is pretty awesome, actually. This is, if you can see it, I can't see this. So that is our build that is straight out of a Dr. Seuss novel, but yeah. it's really pretty. Yeah, Stata Center. Dr. It's really Stata. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like that iconic MIT building. Yeah. Um, hmm, what else? Is there anything, is there anything moving that we can see? I, I don't think there's anything moving right now that I know of. And sorry if this is shaky. I'm literally just walking around with my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> What's this? Sorry? What's this? Look at this. Oh, surgery it's, center? It's just, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> small surgery center. Small surgery center. This is more, uh, let's see. Oh. Ooh, can I see the surgery center? I've never seen that before. I'm not sure that. Uh, I don't know. Let's err on the side of maybe not. Okay. Just to be sure. <laughs> okay. We can describe it to you. Yeah, there's foil. <laughs> there's a lot of tin foil. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> surprisingly. Oh, there's one of your co-authors, right? Yeah, just lab members yeah. scurrying up and down the place. <laughs> Science happens here. They're going to do something very important, I'm sure. Um, okay, let's see what else. We've got three minutes left. Do the thing, what else? Let's see if we can. Biohazard. Yeah, that's what's a big, in there. It's a big do not enter. <laughs> we won't go in there then. <laughs> what's behind the curtain? There's a lot of moving bells and whistles here. None of them are that's moving. That's the Wizard of Oz. Look, Chris, can we go in here? Yeah, yeah, we can go in here. This is a cool room. Look at all this stuff. Microscopes. Can you see tardigrades for these? Can you see what? Uh, water bears. Still press. Water bears? Yeah. <laughs> I've been in every Actually, area. We have microscopes in the other room where we can probably see them. So, wow. So, what's the what's the different resolution of these microscopes? What what have we here? Describe the room. Yeah, so these are pretty low power. So, actually, there are ways of going in uh, of going into the brain and eavesdropping on neural activity. And what you can do what? is... <laughs> you can go in and take these really tiny, tiny microelectrodes, and they basically pick up brain activity. Brain activity is basically a combination of electricity and chemistry. These electrodes pick up the electricity part of it. So now you can go in and listen to the brain and what it's doing by these tiny little sort of jolts of micro-lightning that cells use to communicate with one another. And those electrodes, this is where we build them. Uh, we need the microscopes because we're tiny. There's a whole bunch of tiny wires that you can't really see here. Uh, we put it all together into one little, what's called a drive. A drive. To use into the brain, yep. Wow, it's like the Matrix. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, not. <laughs> My analogies are not really, <laughs> not, not really spot on. I mean, you guys, you guys, this is like a shop in here. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's pretty much the shop of the life. Nice. Okay. What else? Oh, is this the end of the lab? Yes. There's more. No? Who saw this? It's pretty much. It keeps, it keeps coming. It does keep going, yeah. Look at this. This is a huge lab, guys. What is all the look? Uh oh. Is everything present? This is yeah. Okay, we're gonna have to come and do some cool chemistry experiments in here. <laughs> okay, well, so we've got one minute left. All right. And I'm gonna get us in front of some, some like pipettes or something. The science stuff. Like yes. Yeah, so, so, so we did um we did a hangout the Google Science Fair one yeah, time, yeah, yeah. and they were and they the last question they asked me was what advice if you could go back and give your 15 year old self yeah. a piece of advice what would you give so that's what I'm posing to you. All right. Um, I would say start drinking coffee earlier. Uh, <laughs> coffee is a really good thing. No, in all seriousness, I would say um. It took me a while to find out what it is that I actually wanted to do because I was kind of in the middle. I was kind of dabbling in all sorts of fields, and I would just say start that even earlier. Like, there's never any reason to hyper specialize uh, too too early. Like, completely try to make yourself as well rounded as possible because you know science is such an important part of my daily routine. But there's a billion and one other things that also are sort of coloring your daily routine, right? It can be anything from like softball to Shakespeare. It doesn't matter. So yeah. I would just I would just tell myself if I were 15 years old is to go and just explore everything like crazy. Because all of it at some point is going to be useful knowledge, whether you know it at that time or not. 
That's awesome. I mean, after all, you guys got inspired by Hollywood movies. Yeah, exactly. And then made Watch some a lot revolutionary of yeah. research. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> awesome. Well, very cool. Okay, so we're... Thank you so much, by yeah, the way, for pleasure. your time. My pleasure. Um, we might have to do some more hangouts here. This is cool. I'm down. Maybe we'll do one with... Maybe we'll do it with everyone in our building. That would be awesome. Yeah, I'm going to go that around would... every lab. I don't even know what half the labs are going to do. There's a lot of them. There's six floors worth of them. Let's just go in there and put a camera to their face yeah. and see what happens. <laughs> Let's just walk in with our, with our laptop. Oh, we're over time. It's 2.31, so I'm going to end the broadcast. All right. It's going to continue to... Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for viewing. Um, and join us on Thursday for Sun Lab, sort of behind the scenes. We'll be talking with Sebastian. He's actually going to be there. Um, pretty, pretty exciting. So, Oh, and it's Geek Week, so go play our Play the Geek, Geek Week. week.